Um, it's um, a very interesting conference and a very interesting uh, theme. And the issue of the urban routine has in a way uh, been the basis of my own um, deep concern as an artist and as a teacher to do with uh, how to make the city as a home. And inevitably, my thoughts about how the city is a home returns to the city of my youth, to Montreal, and um, the notion of wandering, which uh, seemed to be intrinsic to my experience of that city. And that wandering, uh, I realized, was very contingent upon the idea of a network, a constructed, specially constructed network, which was supposed to organize or reorganize, recast uh, the city's interior life. Networks which produced interiors, which became the most important uh, public spaces of the city, a complete transformation to the city in that way. First, I want to describe, or just, just the term, the network, so we're aware of what it is. A group or system of interconnected people or things and of course, I think this uh, network is uh, central to our experience of the public interior today. We're very familiar with the network. The shopping mall and the airport are legible more through their uh, network characteristics uh, rather than any uh, latent spatial characteristics. Networks infer, enable, and order movement, transit, contact, connection, exchange. Uh, networks, of course, are characteristic of the organization of the city. And currently, the network has come to be isolated. I say currently. It's the condition of modernity. Isolated is a key instrument in ordering increasingly complex urban configurations where traditional spatial hierarchies are either inadequate or illegible. And other interests or entities uh, require service, integration or a kind of visibility. Frequently, these networks are presented as though they are organic, natural, and their flows and meetings are described as natural processes. I said before, the network has been uh, essential to the development of cities, whether they have emerged from tabula rasa origins, as in the case of Roman settlements, or from consolidations of informal arrangements as we see in the establishment of towns along key trade routes in Asia Minor, the Middle East, and North and A Northern Africa, or Venice. Um, uh, and of course, these are consolidations of central network-like devices or beginnings, such as bazaars, souks, and markets. Uh, now, in modernity, the network is an explicit device uh, of the late 19th century metropolis, and the notion of planning, um, uh, as we bring to mind Haussmannian Paris, a case in which the network both makes and destroys the city, um, just referring to our talk at the beginning of the day. Uh, and of course, Paris's equipment, avenues and arcades are very much elements of the network. We can think of gridded New York, its antagonistic adjacencies and its culture of congestion, or radial Moscow. And of course, there are networks associated with the machinery of the city itself, its sanitation, electrification, transit, and data exchanges. The network, of course, is the preeminent operative motif of post-war avant-garde architecture of 20th century in capitalist societies from Team 10, for whom the Souk, Medina, Kasbah, and Bazaar offered uh, anti-hierarchical organizational and spatial models uh, that seemed uh, democratic by inference, uh, to m metabolists, for example, who imagined a, uh, or posited complete, uh, complete uh, networks in organic form and hierarchy. Uh, all have implied uh, and produced interiors that are emblematic of the experience of the urbanized public realm. The networks taken in isolation or understood as a complex produce a condition of modernity. In this regard, the network represents modernity. Uh, my interest lies, um, of course, in the interiors that these networks yield, which engage and entertain 
kind of paradox of control and freedom. And as I said before, uh, my fascination doesn't come from New York, which I've shown here, but from uh, the new downtown core of Montreal from the 1960s uh, and the 1970s, which I experienced as a kind of user or as I naively thought of it uh, as a citizen. Um, as I suggested earlier, um, this talk will concern one aspect of Montreal's, ur Montreal's urban routine, this notion of wandering. Uh, and this m project, which I'll describe as a kind of case study, um, uh, concerns uh, purely people on the move, people going to work, people using a specialized part of the city to do with work and consumption. Uh, and this core, this uh, core of this interior, or downtown I'm talking about, was the so-called Ville-Marie development, a piece of the city which centered on the city's central station and included um, uh, Place Marie, a very important uh, complex designed by uh, uh, I.M. Pei with Henry Cobb and Vincent Ponte, Ponte's name will come up again, who were inspired by, the, yes, this image, central station, uh, uh, Grand Central, central Terminal in New York, and also the Rockefeller Center. Um, and the core also consisted of, I don't know if I've got a next slide. No, I don't. I'll hang on here. Um, Place Bonaventure, which sits at the bottom. A metro station called Metro Bonaventure, which is very important. The intricacies of their relationship are very, very difficult to describe, but I'll try. Um, together, they constituted a public, interior, uh, public network interior whose use formed the central image of urban public life at the moment in the 1960s when Montreal's self-discovery as a city, uh, when Montreal discovered as a, itself as a city of the present and the future. In a way, it's a construction which seems to concretize or anticipate or act as an engine for a complete uh, shift of a city's sense of itself and people's uh, sense of emancipation and action within that city. Uh, the dream of the future was uh, uh, reinforced by construction at the same time of a n network of aerial motorways connecting all parts of the city and the regions to the center, and quite literally to this development in the middle, and uh, the construction of an urban underground public transport system, the metro, which was very modern, uh, and the universe construction of the Universal Exposition, Expo 67, which proposed a new urban model as a kind of entire arrangement, but also fragments of urban models in, uh, as they were embodied uh, by the architecture, the visionary architecture, experimental architecture at the time, including Buckminster Fuller's dome. So all at once, Montreal was presented with a complex of networks that were utopian in character, which served as scenes of the city's self-realization and emancipation. And altogether, they constituted a complete and systematic overhaul of the city and its image. Images of the city happening in this extensive uh, and almost continuous network interior uh, proliferated in magazines, newspapers, documentaries, and films. I hope we're going to see a, well, the slides are, as usual, have a strange relationship to my uh, talk. But, um, I, I think I'm kind of notorious for this, but they're all there. They just might happen at a different mo moment. Um, uh, so we see uh, Place Vermeer's uh, interiors, maybe I'll get them, as uh, um, the center of life of an urban society with a new vision of itself. The metro, the embodiment of the future, uh, the motorways, uh, tools and symbols of mobility and freedom, and Expo 67, a concretization of utopia. And, and at this time, the city the city and its image broke free of its dependence on the institutions of the church uh, and the streets of its working class districts, which were also part of its imagery, and found itself represented in new domains that were all about freedoms, freedoms of movement, of association, and consumption. So this central project, uh, oh, so there we are, people on the move. Uh, in the middle of this Place Vénérie project. So this central project um, contained a vast underground and above ground complex, a kind of layer cake implanted in the city's topography with existing rail lines at the bottom. 
uh, and uh, uh, networks of underground roads for trucks, parking, pedestrian passageways. Uh, and, and this um, particular place, which you see here, a pedestrian concourse or promenade uh, just under the street level. Uh, and this project occupied uh, three city blocks running north-south and sort of avoided the streets completely. You sort of moved through these spaces as though you were moving in one continuous interior, one furthermore that was connected to uh, the metro system, which of course was built to connect people all over the city. So this all happened within a span of four years between 1962 and 1966 or 1967, if you take Expo into account. and. Um, in a way, uh, the, the plan was uh, designed to produce a condition of uh, organized congestion, um, uh, where uh, uh, pedestrian footfall, uh, commercial activities, office activities could all be brought together in order to, uh, and rationalized to produce a, a denser and more efficient downtown, and furthermore, a downtown which would attract uh, and encourage uh, future uh, development. Uh, and it was, of course, a congestion of people, too. Some 160,000 people per day were using this particular space, passing through it, shopping, eating, socializing, and so on. Uh, uh, of course, those people were not uh, dwellers of the city center. They were essentially commuters who were on their way to work. Um, the central uh, environment, as I said, was this low ceiling concourse, which was called rather glamorously Les Ga La Galerie des Boutiques, um, which was treated as a legitimate public realm, not just as a shopping mall. It was inspired, according to the architects, by the arcades of continental Europe. It was materialized very beautifully. It was actually a rather elegant space, despite the fact that it was very low and like a concourse. But the prom promenade, uh, represented the ideal, oops, there it is in the layer cake, Rep and you can see this just this thin sliver of public, public realm within this blasphemy development itself. You have to imagine this public realm continuing out towards you in the audience and some, ending up somewhere over there. Uh, but just this thin sliver of space which you moved over and through as though you might move through a, a topography. Uh, so, uh, of course, these spaces were representative of an entirely new kind of uh, uh, public uh, interior, uh, one which was visually and environmentally uh, artificial. Uh, Montreal, of course, bears many relationships to Moscow in terms of its weather, topography and weather. It's cold in the winter, very snowy and rather hostile, and blisteringly hot in the summer. So, actually, an environment which invited uh, use like that was most welcome. But the um, Plasphemerie uh, project almost immediately initiated a series of informal extensions, uh, connections, and links to separate developments. Well, here you see this core development just starting to spread and connect with other things. And of course, these are the planned informal connections. There were lots of uh, impromptu in informal connections which were made to the network. Um, uh, and those impromptu connections uh, linked up to other buildings, which linked up, of course, to larger urban structures. Uh, so from these beginnings, new kinds of interior realms accumulated and blossomed. Uh, what gradually unfolded was a spatial infrastructure that accommodated a wide variety of programs, from uh, very modest ones to very grand ones, and of course from uh, mere passages and concourses to legitimate public spaces, buildings, and facilities. Um, uh, it's quite, as I said before, it was uh, embraced uh, initially just because it got people out of the hot and the cold, um, but its uh, qualities have been, uh, in a way, taken for granted by Montreal's citizens and have become deeply familiar. And despite its banality, or the uh, banality of much of it, it was and remains a kind of home for its users, and I stress that use again, as natural, despite its artificiality, as the city's streets above ground. And these spaces uh, thereby achieve a kind of beauty uh, which uh, resides in part in their appearance and in part in their atmospheres of freedom. Uh, I'll have to go back to that. I'm slightly ahead of myself, but uh, well, we'll leave it there for the time being. The many references that were used for the core of the project uh, concentrated on the distribution of uh, vehicular movement. Uh, 
uh, uh, different goods on different levels. Schwarzinda by Leonardo da Vinci was quoted. Uh, Grand Central Terminal, as I said before, was very important, you know, which has this multi-layered distribution of infrastructures and complex programs. Um, uh, the Rockefeller Center, I, I mentioned before, too. But um, uh, uh, Grand Central Station was the most important of these. Um, the idea of uh, the development was ultimately legitimated, at least in the, according to architects, by the discourse surrounding megastructures and reappraisals of 19th century uh, projects for mechanical urban structures. Uh, and of course, their control of uh, urban patterns, of urban routines. Um, of course, in the 1960s, there was also an obsession, you would call it, with communication technology, uh, media, mechanization, and computer systems, um, and the space programs encapsulation of environmental problems uh, provided other kinds of imagery which uh, that served diverse protagonists from Buckminster Fuller, Rainer Banham, Francois Dalgré, and Archigram, all of whom found the case of Montreal an object of uh, fantasy. Uh, now, although we don't know, and this is where the slides miraculously coincide with my presentation, uh, although we don't know for certain that Arkazum or Superstudio had any knowledge of the project, their continuous monument, uh, and no stop city below, uh, reproposed uh, the interior inferred by the project, using it as a critique of the capitalist project of a total environment of consumption and control uh, with total interiority uh, as its vehicle. Uh, and in this world we are, uh, we, that's us, uh, those uh, perhaps the citizens of a Burning Man's uh, black uh, city, um, uh, we are pictured as nomads in a boundless territory, wandering, existing, unchanging. Um, uh, the project for this core of the Ville Interieure uh, offered spaces that processed, of course, large numbers of people, uh, of computers, uh, com computers, of commuters, <laughs> uh, through uh, pedestrian concourses. Yet, they possessed qualities that raised them uh, from merely functional or instrumental status. They were genuine public interiors with specific material attributes and historical resonances in their forms which, of course, were drawn from European precedents that had been, in a way, radically reappraised, uh, such as the arcades, which are flattened in the case of Place Murie. Uh, and uh, uh, in Place Bonaventure, you see the Metro Bonaventure here, but Place Bonaventure, ancient temples and aspects of local topography, which were transformed and reflected in uh, architectural form in concrete. So, uh, as I suggested before, one had the impression of moving through this landscape, maybe the, that picture, whoops, no, that picture won't come. Uh, one had the impression of moving through a, a, a naturalistic setting or a kind of ruin. Um, one that could, you could ramble over or rearrange in one's imagination. So the daily routine of moving through these spaces, from car uh, or bus or metro on one's way to work, or uh, from work on a night out, um, uh, and that those images were animated by uh, these forms, uh, by the ephemera of, 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 of publicity, or of commerce. This experience was essentially ludic and playful. And of course, these interiors were complemented by the spaces of the metro itself, and this is the Metro Bonaventure. Like all uh, infrastructures, uh, their effect on the city's sense of space was dramatic and profound. And so Montreal decided that its stations were obliged to be emblematic and representative, and accordingly, they were designed as though they were underground monuments in concrete, brick, granite, and steel. Um, this one, Metro Bonaventure, which is connected to this core development, was, of course, a series of vaulted chambers, many stories deep, with bridges uh, tra uh, traveling uh, in space, if you will, over the platforms. And the image of the whole space was reminiscent of both uh, the Baths of Caracalla and uh, Piranesi's Carceri d'Invenzione. Uh, uh, and in a way, uh, it was never considered anything other than authentic, an extension 
uh, of the city, an extension of the street according to its architect. But this station and many others established a monumental order for public space in the city, experienced by the broad public every day, that was resolutely interior, that established a new hierarchy. The spaces of infrastructures were public interiors, and furthermore, the most significant and representative interiors of the city. Thereafter, all the spaces of this interior city, or ville intérieure as Montreal calls it, would become part of a network that contained all the hierarchies that one might expect of the traditional European cities, uh, which were, uh, in Montreal, uh, almost entirely absent. Uh, I think there's a re resemblance between the, uh, this and the idealized urban conditions we've been seeing today. Um, uh, what should we do next? Oh, this is uh, Place Bonaventure, uh, and this uh, project is uh, before you get to the metro. And uh, I talked about its uh, use of motifs of the landscape before, or ancient ruins. The central hall was supposed to be reminiscent of Karnak, and it was monumental and vaguely indeed reminiscent of it. And the pedestrian uh, concourses that moved through and ultimately connected with the metro and bus station were designed so that they uh, actually uh, felt like uh, the land Canadian landscape on which it was built. Um, and this was its interior way back then. Uh, uh, it doesn't look like it's naturalistic, but I can tell you that one's movement through it and across it uh, made it made it feel such, constantly stepping up and down upon great naturalistic forms. Um, and these are the kinds of public interiors, uh, planned public interiors that the city experiences now, which are all completely integrated with this uh, network. These are not the original development, but developments that have taken place since, which end up being real public spaces which people prefer to, uh, oddly enough, to the street. Um, and, um, there, and these are the informal uh, spaces which, uh, which result, which um, I described earlier, which are uh, completely uh, unplanned underground uh, connections between uh, another or one or two more underground uh, uh, cases. It's very much like the arcades of Paris, which were little, little ideal streets connected to other very real streets. And you can see that there's a, uh, a hierarchy or a variety between these uh, completely uh, mundane and absolutely wonderful, the Parfum Cosmique is one of my favorite shops, uh, and, uh, and the very grand spaces of, 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 uh, of Place du Marie itself. So, as I suggest, there's uh, a kind of typological and perhaps topographical familiarity has ensued that accepts concourses, interior plazas, uh, atria, lobbies, malls, civic buildings, offices, theaters and museums, cinemas, markets, down market retail alleys, functional tunnels and stations. Um, and of course, there's an atmosphere of informality to this realm, which has established in its entirety its own natural order. And there's a kind of sympathy between the movement in this realm to the rambling across the open air topographies of the city above, its empty lots, its terrains, its wastelands, all of which are never more eloquent than in the winter's snows and in the summer's heat. Um, in the 1960s, the combination of this formal and informal public interior, or the combination of designed and natural interiors meandering with certainty and uncertainty across and under the streets of the city, yielded an atmosphere of individual and collective freedom that was so liberating and so longed for. And this is the precise condition, I believe, that many of us seek now. Thank you. <laughs>